The previous video introduced the TCPIP model and the network and data link layers. This video completes the model with the other three layers. So sit back, focus on the big picture topics, and don't worry about the details. You're going to see those again and again throughout your CCNA study. Let's jump in. In this video, we'll start out talking about the physical layer, which is at the bottom of the TCPIP model, then round it out with the top two layers, the application layer and the transport layer. Now, as compared to that first chapter of the book, I split out the first section in terms of what I do in the videos with that first section, the first part being about the network and data link layers, and then this video, think of that as section 1B, and then the last video related to that chapter is on data encapsulation terminology. It's the next one up in the lineup. Now, in this video, let's talk about those three layers. Stick around to the end, and I'll give you the usual kind of advice as if you're in a CCNA study group with me. That is, I'll tell you where to focus your study after watching this video. I'll give you advice about review and revision with tools here at Network Upskill, and likewise, review and revision with tools at the CCNA Official Cert Guide. All right, let's get into it. So reviewing the model for a moment, over here on the left-hand column, we've got these five layers, application, transport, network, data link, and physical. And one big point to make is that the top three layers, their definitions come from TCPIP itself. Each protocol is defined in a request for comments document. You can look them up on the internet, download them, read them. However, the protocols and standards at the data link and physical layer come from other standards bodies. The TCPIP standards basically refer to those so they don't duplicate work. For instance, the IEEE defines Ethernet, and Ethernet itself defines both data link and physical layer standards, and we'll use Ethernet as an example just so you get the idea of the physical layer here. All right, so what am I talking about here with this physical layer? Well, there are mainly three ways or three general types of ways that networks can transmit data, and that is copper cabling using electricity, and it's fiber optic cabling with glass fibers sending light over those fiber optic cables. And then there's radio waves through the air, like for wireless communication. So here's an example of a copper cable. Inside these colorful wires is copper, and they're covered with this plastic for protection so they don't break apart. And they have these connectors on the end, and you can see a little bit of color inside the connector, and that's where the wires terminate. And then you can take this clip called an RJ45 and... Lo and behold, the switch manufacturer over here, this is a Cisco LAN switch, has built ports in here where the cable can connect, so you can connect devices easily. Well, the physical layer defines all that. It defines the characteristics of the cable, what connectors to use, what electrical levels to use, the shape of the connector, all that kind of thing to make those physical communications work. Now, you'll see lots more diagrams like this rather than one that focuses on the cable. So CCNA includes physical layer ideas, but it mostly focuses on the data link and network layer. So you'll see concept drawings like this. And when you see that, you should think, oh, there must be one of these cables between, say, PCA and the switch with a port like we just saw. Next, let's talk about some ideas, some basic ideas about how communications can happen over one of those cables with those wires in it. So imagine you've got two devices like a PC and a switch and you've connected one cable and inside that cable there's lots of wires. So we take a pair of those wires, a pair that go together, and we're going to have a current go down one wire and back. So we've created an electrical circuit there. And on one device we're going to call its electronics the transmitter and the other the receiver. Now why is that? Well the transmitter is going to create current on the wire and it's going to go over to the receiver who's going to repeat it back out here. So they've created this electrical loop. And the transmitter is going to vary its signal in certain ways based on physical layer standards. And those physical layer standards say things like vary it this way to mean binary 1 and this way to mean binary 0. And then the receiver can say, oh, um, hey, I, I noticed those changes over time. And that's a 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, that kind of thing. And so communication has happened. So data transfer in this conceptual model happens from transmitter to receiver using one pair of wires inside that cable. Now you can extend that and say, hey, if I want to communicate both directions over this one cable, so one cable connector in each device, we need a transmitter and receiver pair on each device. So at the top, we've got, say, those same two wires 
and we create that circuit and data transfer happens left to right. And then on the switch, it's got a transmitter bit of electronics in that port. The PC's got receiver electronics in its port. We'll use a second pair of wires and data transfer happens in the other direction. In fact, some of the early Ethernet standards that run at 10 and 100 megabits per second did this exact kind of thing. So one of the things each physical layer standard defines is an encoding mechanism, that is, the rules about changing the signal levels to mean one or zero. And one of the early ones that's really easy to understand is called Manchester encoding, and the rules were basically this. To encode a binary zero, start at a high signal level and move to the low level in the middle of the time period. And to encode a one, you do the opposite. Or opposite, You start low and you move high in the middle of the time. So to encode three zeros in a row, you're going to start high and go low three times in a row. So there we go. We go start high, go low in one bit time, second bit time, and the third bit time. And by bit time, I mean, hey, if I want to send 10 million bits per second, this happens once every 10 millionths of a second, right? So you can send 10, 10 million of those in one second. So high to low, high to low, high to low, that means zero, zero, zero. Whereas another example, if we wanted to encode a one, zero, one, a one is start low, go high. So we start low, go high for a one, start high, go low for a zero, start low, go high for a one. Now, by the way, I don't even cover this in the books. I just thought for here, to give you some idea of what encoding really means, Here's a simple example of it. The encoding mechanisms can get way more complex than this in modern networking. But the idea is to just say, have rules that both ends understand about how the electrical signal changes to encode a one or a zero. So to pull some of this together, the physical layer defines the cables, the connectors on the ends of the cable, the wiring inside the cables, the encoding scheme, and its whole purpose in life is to provide a service to the data link layer, that is, to transmit the bits over some medium to some other device. So to pull that together, if I'm providing services to the data link layer, let's talk about encapsulation again for a minute. Here's that PC connected via a cable to the switch. Well, before the physical layer gets involved, that PCA, for instance, might have an app. It builds some data. Then it adds an application layer header and then a TCP header for the transport layer and an IP header for the network layer header. And then even in this case, since it's Ethernet, an Ethernet header and trailer for the data link layer header and trailer. And that's what the data link layer wants to send. So the service the physical layer provides to the data link layer is sending those bits across the link over to the switch. Hey, if you're enjoying the video, consider adding the books as well. They are a great companion to the videos. So if you start at that link and buy, I'll get a few dollars back from the bookseller at no additional cost to you. It's a great way to help support the channel, and I appreciate it. Hey, now let's get back into the application layer. So imagine you're using your computer and you're using any old client application, and that client application talks to a server application. So as a generic view, your client app has a user interface, it's got whatever its core features are. It's got some data storage features for managing files and memory. And then on the server side, it's basically the same idea, but instead of a user interface, maybe it's got an interface to allow administration of the app to set up the services that the app needs to do. But both of them will have some networking features so they can send messages to each other so the distributed app can work. Like your web browser talking to a web server, they obviously send messages to each other. And that networking is defined by the application layer protocol that you find in TCP IP. And we'll explore that here in the next few minutes. So that same slide we saw a few minutes ago up at the top, now we've got the application layer. And here are some example protocols like HTTP and HTTPS that we're all used to seeing in our web browsers. We've got the middle three that are email protocols that you may have seen when setting up email clients. You may not have come across SIP and RTP, but those are used by uh, when sending voice over TCP IP networks, and they're all defined in RFCs that you can go find and read if you care to. So let me take you through a couple of examples. Here we'll start with HTTP. So you've got a web browser and a web server, and you connect, and say you want to open up a web page. Maybe you're looking for my YouTube channel. And so you send this request, and your computer sends it. And they actually just send the application layer header defined by HTTP. It's got a verb in there called get, which means get the content at this place. And this place is defined by a URL. So the request basically means something like, hey, get the file associated with this URL 
And that's really the URL for my YouTube channel. And then, of course, the web server is going to respond with contents. Now, the response is going to have an application layer header and part of the contents of the page. And the next message may just have contents of the page. So if you imagine all the graphics on a YouTube page, it's far more than would fit in one message. So at the application layer, unlike the other layers, it's common to see some messages with the app header and some data and some with just data, and even some with just the application layer header with no need for any data, all right? So that's one variation versus the other layers. As another example, let's look at a email protocol, POP3. And before this slide starts, the email client has asked the server and heard that there are two emails waiting to be retrieved, all right? So POP3 defines a verb called retrieve, R-E-T-R, and the two emails are considered to be numbered one and two. So this first message just has the POP3 application layer header with no data, but the header lists, hey, I want to retrieve email one. So here comes a message with application layer header and some of the email, and then another POP3 message, hey, give me email number two, and there comes email number two. All right, so that's the general idea of what's going on with the application layer. So just to sum up, it provides services to applications, not to higher layer protocols because there aren't any higher layer protocols. So the application itself, so the networking protocol provides features to the app. To send that data through the network, it's relying on the transport layer below it for various services and to deliver the data. And of course, it's using those headers, as we saw in those examples, to communicate with peers as needed. Now let's talk about that last layer, the transport layer, which is the fourth of five in the TCP IP model. Now, the most important point to think about here is these two bullet points I just put on the slide at the bottom. The lower layer provides services to the next higher layer. So the transport layer is providing services to the application layer. At the same time, the higher layer uses the services of the next lower layer. So the transport layer is using what the network layer provides. The network layer provides delivery of packets end-to-end -end through the network. So the transport layer is going to take advantage of that. So let me tell you about some of the features of the transport layer next and how it fits in the overall scheme. It's just doing some of what we need from networks. So think about one computer, and that computer implements physical and data link and network layer features, etc., all five layers at different points in its life. But it's got some IP code to implement the network layer features, and it's got some applications running, like maybe a web browser with two tabs open. You're running an email client on your computer, and maybe you've got a Microsoft Teams voice call going. Now, those applications use application layer protocols, right? So the browsers are using HTTPS, email clients pop three, and your voice calls using RTP. Now, in between here is where the transport layer lives. So I'm going to put a couple of bars in there just to say, hey, that's, that's where we're going to talk about our transport layer features in here. And I'm going to talk about one in particular called port numbers, all right? So let's talk about those. Transport layer port numbers. The idea is this. First off, there are two main transport layer protocols, TCP and UDP. You and I don't pick them. The people that make up the application protocols, they pick them. And when we use them, we use an application. It happens to be using an application layer protocol, which happens to have picked a particular transport layer protocol and so on. So HTTPS and POP3 happen to use TCP in this case. And when you open those browser tabs, they were assigned a unique port number on this computer, say 65001 and 65002 in this example. When you opened your email client, your POP3 client, it was assigned a unique port number on this computer. And it's unique, and that's a dynamic process as it turns out. Point is, each of those applications now have some unique number defined at the transport layer that uniquely identifies each of those application processes. So you can start to guess what use that would be, right? And that voice call likewise, it happens to use UDP as the transport layer protocol, but UDP has the same concept of port numbers that identified the application that needs to get and receive data, all right? So it's a transport layer feature to identify the specific application process on one computer. 
So now we've got identifying numbers for our four application processes on this computer. So now if we fast forward to the arrival of some message through the network, it's got an IP header not shown, it's got say a TCP header, got an HTTPS header, and it arrives. And we look inside the TCP header, transport layer header, it's going to have both a source port and destination port. And if the destination port is 65,002, well, you know what happens next, right? The transport layer code, the TCP code says, hey, do I have any applications that use port 65002? I do. And it then hands the data off to that application process, browser tab number two, rather than one of the other applications, All right? So that's one of the features, port numbers to identify application processes that's part of both TCP and UDP. All right, so that's the idea. So to sum up some of the big transport layer features, they provide services to application protocols like providing them a way to receive their data. It uses the network layer though to have the data get delivered from one end of the network to the other. And it provides various services here at bullet point four. And in particular, TCP provides a lot more services and UDP doesn't. So TCP, it runs a little slower because of all the services. UDP is a lot leaner, but it doesn't give you many services. All right. So header-wise, you're going to see IP header, followed by a TCP header, then followed by the app header and data. If it's UDP, same idea, just with a UDP header instead of a TCP header. All right, one last thing to tell you about with transport, just to do a comparison chart. You're going to see this again, so I'm not worried about you here in the very initial moments of CCNA memorizing this stuff. In fact, in my volume two book, once I get to the equivalent videos, we'll get into this in a lot more detail. But both TCP and UDP use that port number concept that we just talked about. But TCP does air recovery, and UDP doesn't. TCP controls the flow of data from end to end to slow down and speed up as necessary. UDP doesn't. TCP makes sure the data arrives in the same order it was sent. UDP doesn't. All right, so once again, TCP does a lot of services. It just has more overhead associated with that. UDP is clean and doesn't have those extra bits of overhead. As if we were in a study group together, here's some quick advice about what to do from here. In the TCP IP model, honestly, it's the big ideas I want you to get here. If you're like, oh, I don't remember everything you said, don't sweat it. All right, you're right in the first stages. Don't worry about it. Just don't forget about the data link and network layers that were covered in that earlier video. Those are a little more important for CCNA. There is a mind map activity available here, but I don't want you to do it yet. Watch the next content video that wraps up the content related to chapter one in the books. And then there's a chapter comprehensive mind map activity. Do that one. If you are reading the books, hey, read the matching book content. It's only like two pages total. It just gives you a second look at the same material. And then finally, the important layers in TCPIP compared to CCNA are the network and data link layers. CCNA is all about routers and switches and what they do, and most of their logic is at the network and data link layer, all right? And just for fun, um, some of the things in CCNA don't really fit in a TCP IP layer, but probably 40 and 35% or so, based on my estimation, of what happens in CCNA happens in the network and data link layers, and maybe a little less than 5% at the layers we talk about here. But it's kind of fun as you study along and you learn a new topic is ask yourself, where does this new topic belong in the TCP IP model? It's a great way to think about the model and to kind of internalize and organize your thoughts. Thanks for sticking to the very end. Two suggested videos on the left. If you haven't seen the video on the data link and network layers, check that out. If you're ready for the next topic, hey, click on the right. You'll jump right into it. Thanks for hanging out. I'll talk to you soon.